Hi everybody and welcome to this edition of Thinking Out Loud. Um, I want to start by introducing the other host of the show, Katrina Fancook. Hi Katrina. Hey there Arizona, it's always great to spend time with you. I totally agree. And our special guest today is going to help us for those times when we have difficulties making decisions. You know those times I'm talking about, we've all had them. His name is Tim Brownson. Hi Tim. Hiya, and uh, thank you for inviting me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I wanted to start out by doing some shout outs in the audience because people started lining up early, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, Dave Pipe says, Hi, rain, clear skies, and temperature down to 45, <laughs> so you would think it's positively balmy. <laughs> <laughs> And we also have Kristen Drysdale in the audience. We just, they're all like saying hello to everyone. And Jamie, Jamie, if I tried to pronounce your name. McConaughey. Oh, thank you. There's a can't, for some reason, he's not showing them. I can't click him up there. And um, so, and we've, we've had people lining up all afternoon saying, checking in, going, hey, I'm checking in. So it's wonderful. I wanted to, to take a minute and thank the audience. I mean, we are just at three months today. Uh, we actually broadcasted our first show December 5th. And, you know, I, I just think we've built such a fabulous audience. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to thank you very, very much. So, and now let's let Tim, you want to introduce yourself a little bit and tell everyone a little bit about you know, who you are and what you do? Okay, uh, I am. Um, you, you may have noticed by my accent, I'm, a, I'm an expat. I'm a, a Brit living in Orlando. Been here for uh, nine years now. I've been a full-time life coach for ten years. Before life coaching exploded, you know, I was doing it when nobody knew what a life coach was. Well, most people don't want life coaches now, but you know what I mean. Um, I'm a internationally published author. Um, I have also got another business. My, my coaching business is a daring adventure and I, I specialize with people that feel stuck, people that feel like they've got more potential and aren't maximizing it and maybe want to transition to working for themselves, etc. But I also train other life coaches. I've got a business called Coach the Life Coach and uh, I am passionate about helping other life coaches because the industry is full of training organizations that really don't care. They might like cattle markets. It's like get them in, get them out, and then they're left on their own, and most life coaches are struggling badly. So uh, I'm also an NLP master practitioner, a certified hypnotherapist, and a St. Louis Rams fan. Go Rams. For my, which, which is really bad news. Really, isn't it? You know, of all the teams I could have picked 25 years ago, I picked one. It was just going to drive me to distraction. So there you well, go. Well, I, I picked the Cowboys, like, oh. years and years and years. I'm going now. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm here. I have to go with the Broncos, you know. Yes. Yeah, I don't mind the Broncos. I, I, for some reason, I just like Peyton Manning. I don't know why. I think he's got a bit of a wry sense of humor. I just... And he's, you know, the guy is obviously so committed to what he does. I just, I just I like him. I know he gets a lot of stick, but... Yeah, I'll, I'm okay with the Broncos. Well, I want to let the audience know that we do have the comment tracker running, and Alan Chong just joined. Hi, Alan. Uh, so if you have a question, ask, and we'll, we'll uh, throw it out there. Katrina, do you want to start uh, yeah. with a question to Tim? I would love to. Um, I know that in terms of the work that you do with people, core values are really, really important to how you help people get unstuck. And I would love to hear a little bit more about your just your experience and some of the ideas that you have behind those those core values that drive us to make the choices that we make and how they sometimes put us into a corner a little bit. Okay, um, I mean the, the thing is core values, you know, it, it, I, I could take, well I couldn't, but you know, I could take your job off you and you would still be left. I could take all your money out of your bank account and you would still be left. I could take you know, a lot of things off you, you know, strip you down, even down to you could lose an arm or a leg, heaven forbid, you know. But the one thing that is always going to remain constant is your values. You know, even our beliefs, I mean, values can shift and they do shift. But 
Um, even beliefs move around all the time. Um, so the core values, so for me when I'm working with a client, to understand what's really personal to them, you know, what's really important to them at a deep level, is critical because otherwise I end up coaching them from my perspective rather than from their perspective. So you said, um, interestingly, that um, you know core values drive your decisions and I had a conversation with a life coach yesterday who said the same thing and I, and I basically responded by saying, no, they don't. Core values should drive your decisions, but some people override them. So if you ever get that gut feeling where you think, you know, I'll give you an example. So the last job I took in sales, um, I went for the interview and I got to this, uh, this place, it was a purpose built with the company, Walters Clough, the biggest HR outsourcing company in, in Europe. And they took me around, and and, my, and all the time I was thinking, you know, this isn't for me. This isn't for me. It just it's not right for me. And then at the end of it, they said, oh, the the managing director, which is equivalent to the CEO over here, would like to talk to you before before you go. And I said, okay, you know, just as a point of courtesy. So I went to sat down with him, and we were talking. And he said, you know, we'd really like to have you on board. He said, and of course, there'll be a a, a seven and a half thousand pounds, which is what uh, twelve thousand dollars golden hello for if you sign. Suddenly, my values, bang, they were out the window. I'm like, oh, oh seven and a half thousand. I can buy that BMW. <laughs> Actually, I literally, literally bought a BMW on the way home. <laughs> I called my wife to say, I bought that Beamer that we, I was talking about if I got this job with a bonus. Well, not, obviously not all of it, but um, so it which felt great for about a week. Yeah, and I got used to the car, but my values and the, and the values there was a sense of a lack of integrity with the business. It was all about sell, 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 sell. Rather, you know, I was brought up. Unfortunately, I got into sales working with my father, who was very much about sell to people's needs. Mm -hmm. You know, don't sell, to, find out what they need help with, and then sell it to them. Don't sell to you if you're selling to your needs. You're not doing your job properly. So that, that was a great example of me overriding my values. Right. I didn't know what they were called then. I didn't understand that. I just knew three or four weeks later, I was like, how did I get into this job? Mm -hmm. you know, and the fact was, the money overrode everything else. You know, Everybody knows money doesn't bring happiness, but everybody knows money doesn't bring happiness for other people. <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, you know, it doesn't bring happiness. Uh, but actually, I do need the 20% rise. You know, I do need the uh, the Jimmy Chews or whatever. You know, what, you know, it's and, and it's kind of weird. So that's an example of where, if I had known what my values were, I could have sat down, not rushed into a decision. Mm -hmm. and said, okay, well, what's important to me? Integrity is really important to me. Do, well, I, I, yeah, go on, I sorry, have, I'm sorry, Jim. No, carry on. I beg your pardon. Um, I have a, a quick question to ask you. Um, when I was reading one of your books, you stated in there that none of your clients knew their core values. How yeah. can that be? I mean, you, you know, you you think everyone would know their core values? Um, because it's not it's not the kind of thing that most people stop and think about on a daily basis. They think we we tend to think about goals and what we want to achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the example I use. Um, to, to, to explain this is, let's suppose you say to me, a client of mine, and you say to me, Tim, I want to hire you. And I had a guy who, who once came, and his goal was to earn $3 billion. It's a pretty big goal. I think we can all agree. And, and by the way, he's, he's not far short of it. He sold his business to the Singapore his government. But, you know, three, me knowing a client um, wants to earn $3 billion doesn't tell me anything about them at all. They may want $3 billion because they want to open a couple of um, home, homes for the ho homeless. They do want to go out there and do charitable work. They want to do that. They may want $3 million or $3 billion rather so they can buy loads of drugs, a big boat and get loads. You know, it could be like Wolf of Wall Street type of three. You've got two completely different people with the same goal. Mm -hmm. So goals as a rule... A, you know, there are exceptions. That, you know, if you've got a goal that you, you know, you, you, you want to help all the, you know, if you want to help the, um, the poor baby seals in, in the Faroe Islands from the brutal, I hope you haven't got many Faroe Island 
viewers, <laughs> with, with, with clubbers of seals, then yeah, that tells you a bit about somebody, they're an animal lover, they're caring, they're compassionate, they're empathetic and whatever, um, but as a rule, so you've got to go deeper than that, and I think most people, it's kind of uncomfortable mm -hmm. for a lot of people to go deeper, it's easy, you know, I, I, I love the, the Thoreau quote, you know, um, um, ordinary people leading lives of quiet desperation, and it's kind of like, it's just easier to go with the flow, you know, we go to school, we go to, then we go to university, I mean, it's all school over here, I know, but then we get, we get our degree, and now, you know, maybe a mat, and then we go to a job, and we earn money, and then we look to get married, and then we look, to, without stopping and thinking, hang on, why am I doing all this? Is it conditioning, or is it because I really want to do it? Right. And most of the time, it's through conditioning, and what happens is, you know, my average client is a 40-something. So I, I've got a, if you did a bar graph of my clients, it would like shoot up at around about 35, and right the way to about 55. Um, I don't deal with many people under the age of 25. I don't like doing it. And I have a client so as old as 79. I've had two 79-year-old clients. Um, and, but it's people getting that stage in life where they think, holy crap. Half of it's gone, and I'm doing something I don't like. Oh, yeah, I've been yeah. there, done that. Yep. It's you know half our waking life as adults is at work, for you know for the most part. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. Now, if you're spending half your waking, we, we get a, a brief moment in time on this planet, and if you're spending half of that time doing something you don't want to do. It's, and, and I was. I made lots of money in sales. I was, you know, I don't want to be arrogant, but I was very good at it. And yeah, I made six-figure salaries. And you know, this is going back at 10, 11 years now. Um, but I wasn't very happy. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I was, you know, going out and spending a thousand dollars on a suit to feel better about it. So I'll go buy an Armani suit, or I'll go out and, well, you know, I once spent four and a half thousand pounds, which is about seven thousand dollars. For a long weekend to go and watch the Rams play the Cardinals in in Phoenix, you know, just because I needed to get away from work, and that that's the kind of money that I would waste. When really, you know, I, I can't remember who, who 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 the quote was by, but you know, wherever you go, you take your head with you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you can't you you, know, you can't buy your way out of things like that. It's a question of changing the lifestyle. Yeah. So how do you help people that have had those skills? Like obviously in sales. You were really good at it. You were using your natural skills, but just not necessarily in the right application in a way that made you happy. So, what are some suggestions that you give to people where they know, like, hey, these, this is my natural skill set. I'm not sure if I can make money doing this, or how how do you kind of coach them in a way to to position themselves so that they're doing things that make them happy? Because you know, sometimes what you do for a hobby shouldn't be what you do for a living. No, I definitely agree with that. And 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 it's you know when you said. You said then, you know, this is my natural skill set. You know, it's like to me, it's all about what do you want to do. Mm -hmm. People get too wrapped up. So when I'm talking with other coaches, and, and we're, and especially when we get into niche marketing, and they say, well, yeah, I'm good at this. I'm like, I don't care what you're good at. <laughs> what do you enjoy? What do you want to do? You know, mm -hmm. I could have when I started. It would have been very easy for me to have started. Just coaching salespeople because I would have had instant rapport, instant credibility. I could have put my resume on my page and said, "Look, I've worked for these top, you know, three Fortune 500 companies at a high level." And you know, I. But then it becomes like the reason I left sales was because I wanted to get away from salespeople. <laughs> I mean, there's <laughs> there's some great, there's some fantastic, very ethical, honest, and you know, dedicated salespeople. But it's ruined. The, the industry is smeared by a lot of people who are just in it for the cash because you can make a lot of money in sales if you if you've got the ability if you if you understand it. So so the first thing is like you know um, if you can't make money, there's not many things you can't make money. At. I, I agree. I'm definitely not a woo woo coach that says you know just follow your passion. Well, if my you know if I follow my passion, say in my twenties of golf. <laughs> my handicap was never lower than 19. Like, it's just like I'd be broke. What's the point? You know, you can go and stand on any golf course on a Sunday morning. Early you know, watch these people. It's just like you, know, you hear the thing. If you if if you if you're good at this and you don't like it, imagine how good you'll be at something you like. 
Right. It doesn't work. Life doesn't work like that. I was great at sales and didn't like it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's things that I absolutely love now that I'm I'm terrible at. Trust <laughs> me, there's a lot of things I'm terrible at that I really enjoy. You know, my if you see me type. You know, I've written nine books and I type like a five-year-old. But I bet there's five-year-olds that are better. Too. You know, I'm a two finger. It's, it's you know, and I love to do it. I love to write, but I'm just a terrible typist. You know, and 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 a butcher the English language as well. I I have to lean very heavily on people helping me when it's a, a book, blog post, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Did that answer the question? I'm not sure if I answered your question there. No, but, no definitely, because I do think that sometimes people can use those two things, that this is my natural ability, this is what I shine on with, and it's really a fuller picture. It's not just that one thing. You have to look at all of the places, where you're at in your life, where where are you struggling, what what are your you know, what is the bigger picture of what you're really passionate about doing and how do they all fit together? It's it's not yeah. just a linear thing. And sometimes we have to accept that, you know, our passion, and you made an interesting point about, you know, what you're passionate about should not necessarily be your job, your hobby. Mm-hmm. And, and I know there's a lot of people in my industry who would disagree with that. I would actually agree with that and think it's a very wise statement because you, you can actually burn out. I know people that have taken their hobby to be a business and suddenly it's not got the same interest to them because mm-hmm. the, the, because it's now it, it, they, they're required to do it. To put food on the table, whereas previously it was something that was fun to do. It was, you know, it was a. You know, I I love to meditate. I don't want to be a professional meditator. <laughs> I wouldn't like to feel like I've got to do it. You know, and I read the Dalai Lama meditates for four hours every morning. I was like, oh, four hours, you know, half an hour, and I'm done. You know, so it's kind of you know. You may have a you may you may love to wrestle ostriches in warm chocolate, but you're not going to get paid to do that. It may go viral. Actually, it may go viral on YouTube. You may get a good hit for that, but it's a one. It's a one off. It's really it's not it's not scalable. You know, unless you take it to other sort of aquatic birds and stuff. I don't know maybe. Yeah, well, I think Arizona's got a good quote that's in, in alignment with what you've been talking about. So why don't we check that out? Yeah, Jamie McCarthy. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. In human needs, says in human needs psychology, our basic needs are considered to be a stronger driving force for behavior than our values. Would you say, Tim, that that is why we often make decisions that are not in line with our core values? Yeah, that's a brilliant question, Jamie. I I, I fully I fully agree with that because, and and if you think about, so let me let's suppose I've got a a client and and this happens a lot and this is the trickiest client for me. So let's suppose I worked with recently a single mother who had six kids, okay, and she was doing two jobs and she wanted to. I've got to be careful what I say now because I don't want to. I don't want to. Obviously, I don't want to um, identify her. But she wanted to get out of the jobs and do. She wanted basically wanted to do coaching and that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but her income requirements to put you know when you get to Maslow's level you know the, the, the shelter you know and, and safety the, her income requirements were such that she just wasn't going to get that first level you know she wasn't going to be able to put food on the table because unless she was very lucky or got a lot of money which she hadn't she hadn't got any money you know coaching is difficult it takes time to build up and for her to step away from those two jobs when she got two kids and yeah. you know so um do you know something i think that's one of the best questions i have ever been asked because i had never thought about it like that before and uh, that is awesome. Yeah, I, I, I do. And, and I'd never thought of it in that context. I, I, I've thought about it because I've had loads of clients where it, there's this clash of like, you know, ca- you know, ca- can you make that transition? Because you know, at the end of the day, we've all got to put food on the table. Mm-hmm. We've all got to you know pay our mortgage or rent or whatever it is. And and so it, it's it can be a little bit. Um, Rash or a little bit irresponsible to say, you know, if you've got a, if you've got, you, know, you, you say you're a guy and you, you or a woman and you're earning two hundred grand a year and you've got a big house, you've got four kids, you've got a big mortgage or what have you, and you decide, you know what, I, I want to backpack around the world because <laughs> that fits with my values of adventure and freedom and whatever. But then you start looking, well, well, is there a value that's higher than that of maybe family? Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, yeah, good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
And I think you were, you know, to, to kind of, you know, just kind of put a, a period on the end of that sentence too. It, it can be that the challenge that you feel within you too, because you know that you have this desire, and you're looking at what the reality is. And there is a way to coach yourself through that too. I mean, just because it doesn't happen instantly doesn't necessarily mean it'll never happen. You just have to find a way to yeah. kind of transition into it so that it's a realistic transition, not just yeah. like, take it. I was screw my family. I'm just going to go travel around the world with my backpack kind of thing. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye. So as long as, you know, you, you're, you're kind of checking back in with those core values and saying, okay, right now this is what it is, but how can I find a way to legitimately transition into something that is more in alignment with what I want? Exactly. I mean, one of the things with coaching that, you know, it is a great industry to transition into, you know, to segue in. Sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you've just got to, you know, you've got to make that leap. You've got to take that risk or, or, or whatever. And, but in those situations, it's like, well, what do your family, you know, it's like making sure, you know, I, 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 and, and there's a question come up, I just very briefly, I, I, there's something called smart goals, which I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with. And there's two things, and, and I change smart goals when I use them and call them smarter, which is a, a bit pompous, I know. But the E and the R, uh, the last E and the R, are environment and reward. Now, mm. reward means your values, not a, fit, not a financial reward. So is it, you know, are you going to get the reward of your values with that goal? But the E that gets missed so many times in goals is the environment or the ecology of the goal. And that is, what's the impact of the people around you? Right. You know, how is it going to impact the relationship with your spouse or your partner or your kids or your colleagues or your friends or your family or whatever? And people forget about that. So like, this is what I'm going to do. It's like, would you do it if you know it's going to bring down, you know, the relationship? It was, you know, because it's going to put so much stress upon your partner or, or whatever. So sorry. Right. Well, and I think Arizona, did you have another comment there that you wanted to share, or did you want to say something? Yeah, we have another comment. Um, Alan Chung. Uh, ask a question and wants to know how how did you reach out and grow your coaching business in such a big way and what was a big leap to coaching success um, so, so when, when I'm when I first started it was fairly easy for me because I was living in the UK still so this was 2004 I started doing some part-time coaching in 2005 I went full-time because um, I got a support network so I've been in sales for so long I knew a lot of people I could reach out to to, to pick up clients and then February 2006, we moved to the U.S. and suddenly I got no support network, and it was starting from scratch with new business. For two years, I I, um, I kept forgetting that I wasn't on holiday or vacation, as you guys say. You know, mm -hmm. to me it was like, oh, it's a warm day. It's five o'clock. I'll go and grab a beer and sit out by the pool at the back. You know, in the, in the house we were renting, and and and. I was lucky that I had a very understanding wife, and also when we sold our house back in the UK, we had a lot of equity, so we, you know, we probably got hundred grand um, to, to 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 use, which I used and abused and, and went through. Um, and then about two years after moving here, I started to panic a little bit. I actually put my sales resume on Monster and had a couple of sort of um, inquiries because nothing was happening and basically I, I made the same mistake, well I'll say it's the same mistake, I know a couple of other people have made the mistake but I come from a sales background and I thought because I'd worked in sales that I also understood more marketing and uh, because I'm, you, you're liaising very often with marketing departments, you're having meetings with them and talking about strategy and stuff and I really did, certainly not online marketing. So at that point I made the decision to really dive in to online marketing, to understand what do I need to do? I need to understand search engine optimization. I need to understand social media. You know, people say, you know, coaches often say, well, I understand social media. No, you know how to use it. You don't know how to use it for a business. It's a big, big difference, you know. It's interesting what you guys have been doing today with your tweets and your things, you know, using it well to get the message out. It's not enough just to be on there. So I think the difference was just being, was a bit of a kick up the ass, the, the, the money was dwindling and um, I, I was being a little bit lazy and then the realization that if I didn't understand, because I didn't want to go back to do offline marketing, so if I didn't understand SEO, if I didn't understand you know, social media, if I didn't understand this stuff, I was going to get buried. Mm. Um, and, but, but I was fortunate though as well, one thing I'll add, I was fortunate because when we moved here, 
I had no competition. So I got clients in spite of myself rather than because of myself. If you, if anybody knows what Wayback Machine is, and you go and look at my website from nine years ago, they're going to be crying with laughter at it. <laughs> my 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 logo was a turtle with a strap of dynamite on its back, um, <laughs> take, taking up, and it was like, yeah, I know exactly. Thank you. And some of my early blog posts were terrible. But since then, one of the things that I've done since then that I, I would encourage anybody to do with any businesses, I have built, even though not people that work for me, but I, I really started to reach out, talk to other people, offer them help, exchange service. I've done a lot of exchanging of services in my early days. I don't do it so much now. And, and just basically listen to other people and where they've screwed up and just like, okay. You know, and, and, and it's amazing how many people will help you if you ask them. Mm. I, I bet at least twice a week I spend half an hour and I'm walk, walking by any life coach contacts me and just can't afford to hire me. I, I always say, call me between 11 and 12 any midweek morning and I'm walking the dogs. There's a good chance I'll pick up and I'm happy to talk to you because I love this business and I will talk to you till you know till I'm going back home again. And that you know, and, and just, here's the weird thing. 75% of them I never hear from again because I get I get emails like Tim, how do you get clients? And that's it, literally, that's it. Uh, seriously, that's it. You know, then I say ring me, and they don't because they don't want to do the work or whatever. So I'm wow. rattling them on to. That is interesting. I mean, maybe they just figure that you'll give them all the secrets in email. Sometimes people feel a little awkward talking on the phone. When that happens. Yeah, there, there, there is that. But if it, but by the end of the day, uh, Katrina, you've got to get past that. Yes. It's, you know, we're in a business. So I've, I've worked with a couple of, of coaches that have got social anxiety, and it's something that I've had in the past. I suffer from generalized anxiety disorder. Okay, I was diagnosed with that in my teens, and it never goes away. It's always there, but I manage it with meditation and um, an, an exercise, basically. I think that's a great point, though. It's a, it's a point to really to know that people that are professional and good at what they do, it doesn't mean that they don't have their own systems in place to manage whatever they have going on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We've all got, you know, we've all got stuff going on. We, we've all got things, you know, that, that's one of the things, that, the big bugbears with me with life coaches, when I tell them, don't try to pretend your life's perfect. <laughs> yeah. People are going to sniff that out. Mm. Because it isn't, you know. I still have days. This morning, I felt really sluggish. This morning, I didn't want to write. I didn't feel in the mood for it, and, and what have you. You know, I'm a fairly lively kind of guy, and what have you. And it's just, just because you're a life coach doesn't mean to say your, your life's perfect any more than a doctor can't get sick, or a mm. hairdresser can't get go bald, or a mechanic's car can't break down. You know, it's just like. The one thing I try to do is just be me. If you, anybody reads my blogs and then meets me for a drink, they're not going to think, oh, my God, I had no idea it was like that. They're going to think, he's exactly <laughs> like that. He's exactly sweats just as much in, in person as he does on his blog. <laughs> yeah, being yourself is the best currency, I always say. Exactly. I think so. Because 90% of people won't like me. Great. They'll move on and they'll find a coach that they want to read. You know, right. I can't appeal to, you know, one of the successes of a business is polarizing people. You know, I'm very, very outspoken on my blog. I'm really outspoken on my blog, you know, and I will call people out and I will just say, you know, and I will, and, and that upsets some people in my industry. And so be it. I, I don't really mind. I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to help my clients as much as I can. I want to be popular with my family and my loved ones, but <laughs> everybody else, if you like me, great. If you don't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Arizona, I know that you. I'm, I don't mean to miss your quotes. I just I don't want to interrupt him because he's on a good roll when he's talking about stuff. So oh, oh Something yeah. Else that popped up. You wanted to share? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, and also I think you have an echo going on, Katrina. Oh, I do. Okay. Uh, so Ron Snayberger says I would love to sit with Tim and discuss some of his views. Great, I'm here. Um, <laughs> call, call me sometime. You, you've just, I've just told you, uh, you know, and uh, this is legitimate. I'm not BSing with this. You can get, call me, and uh, oh, Jackson, my youngest dog's just arrived. He wants to see what's happening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like I say, most mornings, 
tends to be different to the weekends, depending on what, 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 how my wife's work schedule is. But most mornings I'm out with the dogs around 11 and 12. If you want just a chat, a general chat, call me. My, my number's all over the website. Most webs. This is nothing. Life coaches that they don't want to put the the phone number on the website. I'm like, geez. You know, people, and, and, and it's just seriously. I, I get up to yeah. You know, I average probably about fifty thousand unique visitors a month to my website. And it's not like people are pestering me all the time. You know, I probably get one call a day. You know, it's just like I think I can deal with that. I think I can manage with that. You know, and if I'm free, I'm free. But I'd be more than happy to chat if you. And the other one was just Jamie uh, was saying thank you uh, for the great answer. I love the real life examples you give to illustrate. And yes, uh, I agree with Katrina Van Cook. A step by step transition can eventually get you to living more in line with your values. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and again, yeah, it's sometimes you, you, to make that all a step all in one go. It's also very frightening for people, and and mm. you, you you know with with coaching. I mean, some people relish that. It's like some people are like, yeah, let's go for it, let's do it all. But for most people, you know, when you take people out of the comfort zone, it, it, it's 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 uncomfortable by definition, you know. So it, it, the the, the gentler you can do that, the better. Yeah, definitely. Well, and you know, when you're when you're kind of looking at the the big picture of how to really call on your core values, like what would what would be some tips that you have for people that maybe aren't sure what they are? They don't know their own core values. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a process that I use with clients, which is way too complicated to go in now. So I'm going to give you a really sort of down and dirty version of working out your values. On there's two things you can do. The first thing you can do: look at people who you admire. <laughs> look at people who you really think. Uh, you know. So for me, you know, I've got I, I, I massive admiration for the Dalai Lama. Okay, now, uh, he probably wouldn't be drinking a glass of Sauvignon Blanc on a Friday night like I am, but, you know, it's the peace of the guy, it's the, just everything about, you know, because peace is a massive value for me, which is why, you know, I spend a, at least half an hour, if not an hour a day med meditating, because I, I, my mind's all over the place, so I want to have that peaceful mind, so look at people you admire, what, what are the commonalities, what is it about them that you admire, you know? If it's things like money, money's never a value. So you've got to ask your question, well, what, if you think of a word, so, so Katrina, what's important to you? Uh, creativity. Creativity. That's my passion. Okay, creativity. What makes that important to you? What does, that give, what does that give you? Yeah, it allows me to be my true self, and that's that to me is where where my passion is. It's okay, okay so self -learning. what does being your true self give you? Happiness. Okay, so we drill down, and suddenly, and, and then, yeah, and, and most values will come to happiness. Actually, happiness is everybody's number one value. It's, a, it's, it's a, if so, if a client puts that on their values list for me, I just write, scrub it out and say, give me another one. But, but it's, so it's like saying, well, what's important to me? And then, what does that give me? And you keep drilling down, and what does that give me? And you keep mm -hmm. drilling down, what does that give me? And eventually, what will happen is you can't go any further, or you'll start to loop. You'll start to go, well, it gives me, you know, peace gives me freedom, freedom gives me peace, peace free, you know what I mean? You'll start to loop around, in which case you've possibly got two values. So, but but when people say, like, money is a value, well, no, because if I gave you a million dollars, but you can't spend it, you can't invest it, you can't do anything with it, it's useless to you. Right. What people, what people mean is, well, a million dollars could be freedom, freedom to travel. It could be security. People may feel more secure if they've got... A million dollars. It could be status because they want to buy something like that. It, it could be legacy because they want to do something and start a charitable or you know some, some form of organisation that's going to help other people. So there's loads of reasons that things that we can do with that money. So he's asking himself that question. That's the that that was actually the way I taught. It's not the way I use with clients now. It's a lot more complex. I use with clients, but it's definitely a quick and easy way to do it without having to pay me to do it for you. So it's free. Nice. Or you can buy your book and read about it all in your book because that was very well laid out in one of your books. Thank you. Thank you. You're um, well, I, I, Sorry, go ahead. Did you have a question, Arizona? Uh, I was just going to say Rain Dow says she loves it and she loves how you communicate, but she disagrees about putting the phone number on the website. Yeah, Rain's wrong. 
<laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Fifty percent of my inquiries come into. Uh, I've never heard. Of, I've never had a. I don't know what. Uh, what. And I'm being flippant there because rain. It's a little bit different sometimes for a woman than for a man in terms of you know putting personal details out there, and I, and I understand that. Um, but here's the deal. Every life coach that I've dealt with who's told me they don't believe in that, not one of them was full. Half, at least half of my inquiries come direct through my phone number on my website. So if anybody can afford to turn down half their inquiries, and no, I couldn't. Without those half, I wouldn't be full. So then go for it. And also, to make it worse, put a capture form on your that nobody can read on your contact details. I was trying to fill one in yesterday and I couldn't read it. I gave up. I went out. I was just like, D -d 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 <laughs> I'm trying to give me a money here. If you're going to make it that difficult for me, you know, I want people to ring me. And you would think, so it's like people aren't ringing me night and day all over the. You know, it just doesn't happen like that. I, I you know, just just my just my opinion. Well, I had a question about books because clearly you've written many books, mm -hmm. and I, did you write them because you were inspired, thinking like, "Hey, these are some questions or challenges that I've run across with a lot of my clients, and I want to just put it in a book so they have easy access to it," or was it just something like, "Hey, it's your own creative ideas that you just wanted to get out there"? Uh, I think all sorts of reasons. I, I, I think the the first book, I, I, so of the nine books that I've written, two have been published and the other seven have been self-published. So the first one that was published, I think I just wanted to be published. I think there was an ego thing, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, and you, know, you you two guys know the story about that. About it, that We'll not go into that now because it would take too long. Um, so I think there's a bit, so, so but then after that, it was like, okay, where are people struggling? So I wrote a book on stress. I wrote a book on, on anxiety, social anxiety and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, probably the book that I enjoyed writing the most in terms of actually was 70 Amazing Facts About Your Brain because that just stuff, I just loved researching mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, and I, give, I give that away free now to people who subscribe to my newsletter. Mm -hmm. and, or it's on Amazon for two ninety nine or whatever. I loved writing that because that was the kind of book that I would buy myself and read, and it would be just like you know. So there was a lot of research went into that, um, and and probably the best book that I've been involved in is the one I co-authored, which is How to Be Rich and Happy with John Strzelecki. John's had a number of international bestsellers, um, and that was more about we wanted to get something that. This may sound arrogant. It's not meant to sound arrogant, but we kind of wanted to make the definitive self-development book. You know, when we were talking the other day, I was saying about you know most self-development books were just padded, they filled, and and we wanted to get something that was condensed and was mm -hmm. practical and usable, and that somebody could, you know, and then as as you know, we we give that away to charitable causes in this country, and then. Um, rip everybody else off that buys it off all because it's ridiculously expensive at $25 for a paperback but they know that then probably there's 10 copies going to go to good causes as well so uh, so different reasons different mm -hmm. reasons really I think well and you know I know a lot of folks are sort of in the process of trying to figure out hey would be writing a book would that be a good idea for whatever I'm doing whether it's coaching or other things and, you know, as someone that is a professional writer, I see a lot of people trying to turn some things into a book, and sometimes that can work, and sometimes it can't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like to think that there's always a possibility there, but there is a point where you just have to be mindful of how much content's being thrown out there. Exactly. I think it's one of those. There's a conundrum where it's never been more difficult to make a, a book succeed and it's never been easier and, and what I mean by that it's never been easier because the barrier to entry you know so for uh, how to reach and happy for instance when you know we've sold it into a number of countries that mm -hmm. had to be okayed by a sub agent it had to be okayed by the publisher uh, probably two people at the publishing house before they would make a bid on the book so so you've not just got to know what you're talking about. Other people have got to think you know what you're talking about as well. Now with eBooks, anybody can put a book out there. And mm -hmm. I, you know, an example I give a few years ago now. I'm not going to name the, 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 the blog because it would be unfair. Um, somebody uh, ran a ran a competition to do the best blogs on self development in different categories, and one was best newcomer. 
Mm-hmm. And the guy who wrote the best newcomer, I'd never heard of him. I thought, I'm going to go and check this guy out. He'd written a post on hypnotherapy, and I'm a certified hypnotherapist, even though I don't use it anymore. And he wrote this post, and he delivered this information, and there was loads of comments, great posts, this is fantastic. And it was it was actually dangerous, his post. He obviously didn't understand the topic, but mm. he delivered it with such confidence. <laughs> and, you know, and I was like, oh, Jeez, people are going. People are going to try this, and he, he he missed a couple of processes out, and he didn't under, explain something. And he obviously really didn't. Under, he'd read it somewhere or whatever, and was reproducing it. And I think that's the difficulty now is people are unsure. You know, you've got blogs out there that are turning out, and I could name two or three very big blogs that are turning out very poor content on self development. And then you've got some very good smaller blogs that turn out great content but don't get the recognition. Right. Um, and, and, and I think that's just how we go in, how the world is at the moment. You know, it's, it's, it's it, it, like, like I say, the barrier to entry is gone. You just need, you just need a computer and, a, and a, an ability to type. Right. Well, what, what is your uh, favorite thing about coaching other coaches? Uh, I think because I can, with, with coaching, so I, I was trained in coactive coaching, which is very much hands off. It's not really about telling people what to do, you mm-hmm. know. And, and yeah, you know, I'm a fairly garrulous person, as you may have noticed. You know, I like, I, I like to talk and I like mm-hmm. to help people. And with other coaches, I can spot the mistake that, that, when they're often making the same mistakes as me. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 it allows me to you know, change hats, so to speak, without wanting to be too cliched and be a coach one moment and then mentor slash teacher the next and say, no, no, don't do that. Trust me, that isn't going to work. Don't go and do all, you know, that's what everybody else is doing. You know, because most life coaches, they come into the industry and what they do is they go and check all the other coaches' life uh, websites and then they replicate it. What they don't realize is they're replicating failing models because most mm-hmm. life coaches, 95% of life coaches are struggling. So what they're doing is they're copying something that's struggling. Right. And it's like, so they say, well, you know, such and such does this. And, I say, and there's some people in, in our industry that I know that appear to be very successful, but I also know aren't because they've hired me, you know. I mean, and it's like, and you know, I, I know one particular coach who coaches on relationships and marriage is on the rocks and she's trying to pretend everything's okay. Mm. To me, it's like, no, don't do that. Tell people that what's going on. Because they relate to that, and that will make you more human and more approachable and more believable, rather than you've got this magical, you know, life that where nothing ever goes wrong. My dog threw up on the carpet. Anyway, well, no, he didn't actually. He threw up on a rug because we've got marble, but he ran around like a lunatic trying to find a piece of. Lot to throw up on because he knew marble, or granite, or whatever the floor is made. I don't know tiles. I'm probably bigging up a bit now. He knew that would be too easy for me to clean up, so he needed to find some <laughs> to throw up on. That happens, you know. Excuse my language, but shit happens in life. You've just mm-hmm. got to deal with it and realize that every, you know, I can't remember what the quote is now, but it's something along the lines of, you know. What happens is we see everybody else's highlight reel when we're playing our own outtakes. And, and it's true. You know, we see people on their best behavior. Nobody farts on the first date. I think I've just lost half <laughs> your viewers. You know, it's just like you don't do it. You know, it's just like you're on your best behavior. When you meet somebody, you don't dive into deep stuff, you know, whatever. So, but, you know, and that's why on my blog, you know, I, I've talked about the fact that I've had difficulty with anxiety in, in the past. I've talked about the fact that, you know, I, I, I took drugs in my 20s and 30s, partied a lot too much. And I talk about the fact that, you know, every, you know, every now and then I'll get, you know, just really stressed or whatever. Because that's what life's like. I'm just mm-hmm. because I have the tools. I, I can manage it better now, a lot better, you know. But it's like I'm still a human being. My one of my favourite people on the planet is a guy called Body Pashka. is a is a Buddhist teacher who's my teacher for a, for a number of years and still is a good friend of mine now. And I can remember sitting down on a 
we're on a retreat, and uh, him sitting down and saying, his first words were, yeah, I've been so stressed this week. And I was like, oh, that is so fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, I'm sure there are people, you know, like Tara Brack and Jack Cornfield and, you know, and Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh and people like that <laughs> don't get stressed. But for the most people, even people, you know, he's been doing it nearly 30 years. Mm -hmm. But it still creeps up on it. And it's that's why I think that's why I'm attracted to people like that because it's just they're all, you know, you talking about, between before back, when you were describing your values, really what you were talking about was authenticity, wasn't it? Yep. And, and that's what it is. It's being authentic. It's who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, but the Oscar Wilde quote, you know, be yourself, everybody else is taken. Yes, that's my, one of my favorite quotes. It's an awesome quote. Hey, do you, Tim, Tim, do you have, like, your speakers on back there? Because I've done everything I can. I don't I don't know what else, the, where the echo's coming from. I know I it's not me. In, so. Is it still echoing? Yeah, do you have a speaker up, turned up anywhere? I, I really... do. I, I could have put my headphones on if you'd have told me, but they're actually in my car. No, that's okay. <laughs> uh, well, and we're about out of time. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, that's we're, well, well, actually, we're, we're, I'm sorry about that. I do apologize. No, that's okay. <laughs> it's because I've been to the gym. Normally, I have them here because I do podcasts and stuff. But I have them here. But I, I took, I've just got back from the gym before uh, before this, so I uh, I've left them in my car. So uh, well, I'll just say one quick thing because I know it echoes a little bit when I'm talking. Um, I agree with everything you're saying. I wouldn't be able to do the work I do around creativity if it wasn't for my, me going through my own challenges with my own creativity. It's how I'm able right. to help other people. Right. What was that comment I just saw flash up? Uh, I, I just wanted to put this up to end the show on a joke. Um, <laughs> Donald Grant is life coaching. I thought this was about football coaching. Well, well Donald, <laughs> I, I, I mean, we could discuss the relative merits of the 4-3 defense about the 3-4 defense, and we could discuss the relative merits of this of whether the Rams should keep Sam Bradford or they should just should cut, cut him and move on. But... Uh, <laughs> Katrina and Harry are like, what the? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, call, call me and we'll talk about cover two and cover four. Yes. Well, I had a great time listening to you today. You had such great insight packed in 40 minutes. So thank you for all of that. And is there anything else that you wanted to share before you leave about what you have coming up? Something else that you're going to be, that you're working on currently? No, I'm terrible at promoting myself like that. I mean, <laughs> I really am. I just like, you know, I'd love people to go and read the blog and subscribe to the newsletter. You know, it's the, the, the link's there, downadventure.com, or it's coachyourlifecoach.com mm -hmm. is where I train coaches. Um, but I've, I've loved it. It's great. And the timing's great because, like, as, as we said at the beginning, this is the end of my week because I Saturday is the only day I have. I've, I've had a glass of wine when I'm talking to you late, I, and I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. So thank you for asking me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. I had a great time. I did too. I, I really, really enjoyed this. And and for the, those of you who are interested in finding his books, they're they're a fabulous read. I've read three of them so far. And of course, if you sign up for his blog, you get them free. They get quite a few of them free. Four, yeah, four, three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Poor, poor Arizona. Arizona went and bought one the day <laughs> the day that I decided to give it away for free. <laughs> I think I bought it like half an hour before. My, my last blog post, but one, is giving my first published, but you can go and download it for free. You don't even need to sign up for my newsletter. And and bless her, she'd just been and bought it. So thank you. I look forward to that Amazon royalty check in like <laughs> or whatever in six months, you know. I will buy, I'll buy a coffee and think of you. All righty. Um, well, I guess we ought to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody. We have a fabulous audience. Y'all have really hung. And if I didn't mention you, I've tried to mention everybody. If I didn't, please forgive me. Um, and y'all have a wonderful weekend. Talk to y'all later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.